Hello everyone. Would you would you like to write your own version of Angry Birds or maybe even World of Warcraft? Raise your hand. Cool. So at the beginning I have to disappoint you. I don't have full recipe how to write World of Warcraft, but I'm pretty sure that I will cover everything which you can use to write Angry Birds uh, style game. So to not prolong, let's see the agenda. Clicker works. Uh, first couple, we'll start with a quick introduction. A couple words about me and Nick Drasio. Then the story behind cool, cool animations. I call it story because uh, animations in game development and game development in general is a huge topic. So I would like to treat this, this presentation as a story in some chapter or book. Uh, and after that, you will be able to try everything by yourself, experiment, etc. I will cover some concepts, pros and cons, trips and tricks as well, how to optimize things. And after that, we'll jump into more advanced things like 2D effects in 2D. So we don't, we don't have to uh, think only about 2D environment all the time. And particles. So yeah, I'm Greg, as said Stan, but if you forget my name, you can say, hey you. <laughs> and Yggdrasil, uh, we are a multi, multinational company. Right now we have offices in four, four countries, Poland, Malta, Gibraltar, and Sweden. Uh, and in our port portfolio, you can find slots. We have, I think, around 50 released, or we are going to release fifth game in November. Uh, and this is like fully 2D, uh, powered by Pixie.js. Yeah. <laughs> but also we have different type of games. We have uh, 3D Black Jack Sonia, and we are going to release Bingo as well, and many, many more soon. So the first topic uh, will be about procedural animations. Uh, this is also a huge topic, uh, but in general, this is about generating the movement of objects procedurally, simply speaking in code. And of course the most obvious use case here uh, is physics simulations, but it's beyond the scope of this presentation. The point is that we can, even without knowing these all crazy equations of physics, even if without having physics engine, engines, we can really create cool animations using twins and by changing the properties of, uh, of nodes, sprites in Pixie or movie clips or animated sprites. We can change position, rotation, scale, etc., etc., whatever, basically whatever we want. Uh, particles also count as a procedural animation, but this will be covered at the end of this presentation. Uh, but let's start with basic stuff, with game loop, because I believe that this is super important, and every game developer should know what game loop is, uh, what it does, and what's the point of having game loop in our game. So game loop, as the name suggests, <laughs> is a loop. <laughs> Yay. Uh, we can, yeah. <laughs> We can point out like three, three steps in every iteration of this loop. Process input, it should be non-locking. Update, so here we have all crazy calculations for artificial intelligence, for physics simulations, etc., etc. And the last step is just the render. So we can use WebGL, Pixie, and different engines. And game loop is supposed to ensure us that the game runs at consistent speed despite differences in the underlying hardware. So what it means, if you have like two, two machines, one pretty old and the second like the newest one, and the first the old is able to, to run our game with 30 frames per second, the second the new is able to run our game with 60 frames per second. So it means that the player, which the players which will use the, the new, new engine, new hardware, will see everything faster, twice faster. So, yeah, it would be a disaster for us as a, as a game producers. And imagine what would happen if 
if this is like multiplayer game and these players cooperate. So definitely we need to we need to like get rid of this problem and game loop helps helps us to do this. Uh, but first, let's uh, see how we can do it uh, in our browsers. Uh, so, of course, uh, good old set interval and set timeout, but please don't do this. Uh, basically, those, those, those functions are not able to deliver high quality updates as a request animation frame. Uh, you, can, you can have problems with flickering, with shear, even with skipping frames. Uh, so yeah, once again, if you are going to write your own game loop, I really suggest to use request animation frame. But probably you will start if you are not experienced or you are just trying to find new new game game, game engine library. Uh, you, you will use some built-in mechanism. And Pixie, for example, delivers ticker. Uh, so this handles every corner case, and I really suggest to use it. But I think you should know what's going on under the hood. So here we have some pseudocode uh, with uh, three implementations of game loop. So let's analyze them. So here we have the first in the uh, right top corner. And this is as bad as it could be. <laughs> it does, does the job. It processes the input, update and render. So we are in home. But there is no like control over the speed of the game. How we can fix it? So we can we can put after the render method. We can put like sleep or just use this set timeout, and this will ensure us that the game won't run faster. But still, it could be it could be it could run slower on on older devices. So we can do better for sure. And the second snippet. Uh, is a bit advanced, a bit modified. It calculates the delta time, so it calculates the elapsed time between the current frame and the previous frame. And then this time is passed to the update function, and every calculation we do in update, update function should take into consideration this time. And after this update we can render. Uh, it's still not perfect, because once again, for better devices, update will be will be called much fast, uh, many 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 times more than in old old devices. Uh, it could lead, for example, to some some rounding rounding errors because we operate on floats in physics simulations. Also, like calling the update and render is a bit not deterministic, so we can do better again. And here on the right right side of the slide. We have a pretty interesting way how we can implement the game loop. Uh, we calculate the lag. So lag is, we can say that this is how far the game is behind the real world, behind the real clock. And if this lag is bigger than some given, given update interval, we have inner loop. And inside this inner loop, inner loop, we call update till the game catches up. And after that, we have render. Uh, this still can be improved, but I'm leaving this for you as a homework. And the point of uh, showing this to you is, is that that there is like there is no one implementation of of game loop, and there are many cases we have to handle. In browser, you have like your the tab with the game could go in the background, or a player can minimize the, the browser. So there is a lot of lot of corner cases. You need to be aware, but as I said, most of the game engines uh, have some nice built-in mechanism like pay, like Pixie Ticker, which handles everything for you. And before I will show you some code, uh, I just want to talk about the easing functions. So normally, when we want to move something, we just add some offset in each frame. But this will give you linear, linear movement. Sometimes it's okay, but not always. So it would be nice to have simple but powerful way to to apply some nice 
nice movements, uh, nice effects for, for your animations. And we can do it just by using the uh, easing functions. Uh, how it works? So, uh, easing functions are just mathematician formulas which can be applied to reanimation. Uh, it they takes a lapse time, initial value change, and total time of animation, and produce the output. Depends mostly depends on the time. And as you can see on this charts here, uh, the x axis represents time, and the y is value. So we can be very easily very easily produce uh, deceleration, acceleration, even some bounce effect. The bounce could be done at the beginning at the end of the animation on both. So, yeah, this is how we can really simple, really simple boost your animation and give, give our animations nice feeling. Yeah, code, code time. So, yeah, let's say we have machine. We are doing a lot of machines in our company. Uh, and we want to move symbols from from top to down. I need to change my, my hand. Uh, okay, and we are using ticker. And as you see here, we have this. Uh, we have the. We, we we just get get the reel. And we pass the speed. Speed is some constant. Just to, to, to move to move to move the symbols, and we pass this speed um, to the update function. But, but but here, like we do not take into consideration this delta time. So this will work as fast as request animation frame uh, will be updated because request animation frame is used under the ticker. <laughs> here we can fix it. I didn't talk before that we have to use two hands and mic, so sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, here it's, the movement is pretty the same uh, because request animation frames fire 60 frames per second here. But I prepared some simulation of older device. The good thing in Pixie Ticker is that uh, you can stop stop it and update by yourself. So this is I used it under the hood. I create just ticker with some throttling. And let's see. Uh, let's comment this right now. Let's see what happens if we are not going to use delta time in our calculation. As you see, the speed is different. And to prove that I'm right, and you should take into consideration delta. Now it works. <coughs> okay, uh, this was the basic stuff. So let's summarize. Uh, what kind of benefits we have? we have using uh, procedural animations. First of all, physics. So, like, we can, we can simulate nature loss in our games. Then runtime, instead of predefined behaviors and the movement. So here, everything is written in code. We don't have predefined images. We can, like, generate the initial values of each presentation randomly, or we can affect we can use some input from the player, uh, from the mouse, or just response from the server to uh, to modify the behaviors of animation. Once again, we can use easing functions to simply simply modify modify our movement. Uh, there is no extra asset required, so it means that we are safe in context in terms of size of our game. Uh, everything is written mostly. Everything is written in code. Uh, we don't have to download extra extra things, extra stuff. We don't have to allocate extra 
uh, space in memory. Of course, we can mix it with, together with other methods, and this definitely we should do this. And particles, so stay tuned. What about cones? Written in code, so it could be time consuming. Uh, it would require a lot of ping pong between us, developers, and the artists. Uh, not every developer has artistic soul, so it could be a bit painful. Uh, also, if we have a lot of such kind of animations, or we uh, if we made a mistake, it could be like CPU performance killer. Or memory leak, we could we could we could have memory leaks, so we need to be aware of it. That's why I really suggest to use existing tools uh, for more, more more complex use cases. Here I can recommend the GreenSong animation platform. Uh, I don't know if you heard about this, but they have really powerful powerful and simple API. Uh, you can very easily control the animation, like pause, resume, yo-yo, repeat. Also, they support callbacks, so we, we could be informed what happened in our animation. What else? Uh, ah, the nice feature is that we can combine animations in TwinMax into sequences. So we can build timelines, we can play animation one after another, or just at the same time, or whatever you want. So if you don't know this, I really, really suggest try it. It's super, super powerful, and it's not only for games, of course. Okay, uh, let's jump to the next type of animations. Frame by frame, sometimes called asset-based. Maybe I will show the tiger. Uh, or keyframe animations. So here the movement the illusion of the movement is generated by showing the incremental changes in each next image. So we have a bunch of images, as you can see. By the way, this is a sprite sheet, 4K times 4K, so a pretty big one. But this is how many, how many single images we need to display such kind of animation. And benefits of using this. Sky is the limit, so everything is up to animator. Our role as a developer is just to display. Display is on the screen, and that's all. Uh, it's really good in complex animations in which image changes in every frame. And once again, simple to display, and, uh, simple to, to display and implement. <laughs> New work. <laughs> Write it down. <laughs> uh, yeah, basically, if we know how to display one single image, we know how to display the sequence of images. So there is no rocket science. And uh, cons. We need a lot of images to make one animation. As you mentioned, this tiger uh, requires 4K times, times 4K sprite sheets, too, so it's huge. And it's only one animation. Uh, there is no, or it's very difficult to interact, interact, change it in, in real time. And because of the size of the images, because of the amount of these images, we need to be aware that we can really increase the size of our game. So a lot of, a lot of stuff to download. But also this has to be decompressed and then upload to the GPU. So it also more images require more space in memory, RAM and GPU memory. But there are plenty of things we can apply to make our, our life easier and faster. First of all, and I think this is like must be, is to have sprites. So instead of packing, I mean this was, this was covered mostly by Yuma, so <laughs> I don't want to repeat you. Yeah, so let's pack everything into one big, big sprite sheet, big image, and send it to GPUs to decrease the communication be between GPU and CPU. Uh, and the patching. So Pixie does a really good job here, but we need to know uh, how patching works and how to 
not destroy it because, for example, blend mode could destroy it. But once again, I think those two, those two, two, two techniques are like must be. Uh, they can boost your performance a lot. Next, next we can use compression. So uh, in Idrasio, we use PNG Crown to compress compress the PNGs. It doesn't like decrease the size in GPU memory, but still it decreases the size of the texture to be downloaded. So our game can be open faster on the on the customers customers machines. Of course, if you don't need transparency, you can use JPEGs, but here we can do more. Uh, Pixie by default uh, register allocate. 8 bits per each, each color channel, and alpha as well. But we can hug it a bit and change it. And I know that in Pixie 5 it could be possible without without uh, hacking the Pixie. <laughs> uh, so we can use, if, you, if we don't have transparency, we can use 5, 6, 5. It means that for uh, red we can have 5, for, for green we have 6 bits. Uh, and for uh, blue we have five again. If we need transparency, if we need alpha, but we don't have we don't have alpha gradients on our sprite sheets, we can use five 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 one. And if we need this alpha gradients, we can use four four four. But of course, uh, it will have like the worst quality here. Um, I think. This is what we applied a couple of times in our games because last time we produced we produced pretty big game and like old devices just crashed. So after that, for a couple of textures, they started running without any problems. But it also could be tricky what kind of textures can use what kind of uh, mode. So we can play it by ourselves. Sometimes it like requires to juggling the images between sprite sheets. Uh, to achieve the best the best uh, effect, uh, and yeah, we actually did it. And to be honest, there is no like difference if you do it right, but you have to spend a lot of time to adjust everything. Uh, what else? What? Okay, we are good with time. Uh, what else? Uh, of course, lazy loading. This is kind of obvious. So if you don't need need everything at start, just download the animations in the background. Later on, when the game is already, uh, when the game is running, and GPU memory management. So, yeah, I don't want to repeat the math. So please remember about this. This could be crucial. Uh, you can always load and unload textures when you want, and this also like prevents your game before crashing. The next subject is uh, skeletal animations, but this will be covered in the next presentation by Patians. This is super interesting, so stay with, with us. Uh, and now let's talk about 3D effects. So here we are talking about 2D environment, but does it mean that we should stop thinking about 3D? I would say no. And we faced this problem in Yggdrasil, so we had we had a game, and in this game we have a cube which rotates all the time, and on each surface it has randomly picked number, and the rotation should stop, uh, showing the number chosen by server. Let me show you this this effect because I need to drink some water. <laughs> I will show you the code soon, but first let's go through the theory. So what kind of solutions what kind of solutions we had? The first was so lame, just redesign the effect, ask, talk, talk to with designers that we don't want to do this, that we have only 2D games. But 
we are developers, we are game, game developers, and I think this is what makes the game development really interesting. That we have pretty good challenges, and there's like, of course, plenty of, of ways to solve it. Um, the second thing was to use predefined combinations of frame by frame animations. This would work, but only if like the number of combinations would be relatively small. It wasn't that case in our scenario, so we need to came up with a bit different, a bit different approach. The next thing was we were, we were thinking about using different engine, like 3JS or Babylon JS, but uh, we decided that there is not a good idea to learn the new language, try if everything works with our internal framework, if this will work with Pixel. Uh, so, this was also no go. And at the end, we decided to use Mesh from Pixie. Uh, this is pretty powerful thing in Pixie because in Constructor, it takes vertices, indices, texture, and mapping, and just using the, under the underlying mechanism in Pixie, it renders our stuff on screen. So, the last part we had to do was to just apply simplified projection. Yeah. Uh, as you know, uh, we, we had to we had to somehow model we had to somehow represent our cube in code. Uh, as you know, everything which is rendered on WebGL consists of triangles. So, having this knowledge, we need to build build our cube with triangles as well. But it's not so complicated. If you know how to represent one point, which is pretty simple you have x, y, and z, you're able to represent triangle. When you have one triangle, it's easy peasy to build rectangle, and cube is just eight rectangles at eight surfaces. And, but after that, we need to make, make this 3D effect, basically. So, how, how we can do this? Before we, we, before we start doing uh, talking about perspective, let's talk about the projections. In game development, we have two, two projections. First is orthographic or orthogonal, and this is mostly used in 2D games, because there is no depth. I mean, there is fixed depth, but there is no zoom. There is no zoom in, zoom out. There is no possible to change the distance, the distance between uh, scene and the camera. And on the other side, we have perspective. And as you may think, this, this, projection, this projection has depth. We can control, we can control the distance uh, between, the, between the scene and, and camera. But what perspective is? And Actually, it's really try to explain it like, like in simple, simple words and how to model it in, in code, at least for me. But this is like feature that things that are further away look smaller. So let's take this example. If, if our Z, Z represents the distance from the camera, so it means that we need to divide value by the distance using the, of course, for the, to, to project to project uh, the values on our screen, and then we'll 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 get desired desired values. So here we have we have some line, and we want to and we want to uh, calculate the length of this line. And for z equals one, we we'll assume that there is no projection, there is no distance from the camera. Uh, the equation is absolute value from 20 divided by 1, minus 10 divided by 1, equals 10. This is like math from elementary school. And what happens if we increase the z? So it, mean z. So it means that you have like bigger distance from the camera. Uh, we just need to divide 20 and 10. Uh, I didn't write here the uh, y, y values because there are 15, so uh, it's, it's, it always gives 0. Uh, but here we have absolute value from 20 divided by 2 minus 10 divided by 2, which gives us 5. So it works. And the same for 4 and 
etc. So having this knowledge, we are able to write down our algorithm. The first step was to take word coordinates of cube of the triangles. After that, apply some transformations, scale, rotation, translation. Translation is just fancy word for the movement. Uh, because uh, those transformations are needed because the, the, the cube rotates. After that, we have our projection. So we need to somehow map, and uh, not somehow, because now, now we know how to do it. Uh, we need to map 3D object to our 2D screen. And after that, we can render stuff on our displays. Yeah, matrices. So people way smarter than me figured out many years ago that all these transformations should be done using matrices. Uh, I don't want to go into the math. Actually, I had some I had some example and proof, but I decided to remove it because of the time. <laughs> but you have to believe me. I mean, I'm joking. The good point the, the good point is that. You don't have to know how it exactly works because there are many like existing libraries you can use. You just need to know that you should use matrices, and it's only it's not only for for two D. It's also for two D. Um, and the last thing we need to we need to know it's how to how to skin our cube. So here we have UV mapping. It's UV mapping is uh, like description which pixel on the image, which pixel on the texture corresponds to which image on the 3D mesh on our cube. Uh, we need to be only aware that when we send texture to the GPU, the coordinates, so the U and V, is between 0 uh, and 1. So we need to take this into consideration if you have sprite sheets. And now I think it's time for code. So, uh, yeah. Can you see it? It's okay. I think. So here we have some motive for this crazy matri matrices calculations. But the yeah the interesting thing I mean okay I can go five by five maybe this this will be better so vertex pretty simple triangle as well as well there is no magic here we just take we can build triangles using three vertices of course we here. Uh, we also calculate the normal vector, to which indicates uh, how the how the cube, which in which which direction the the, the cube the, the surface of the cube uh, is is like located. Here we have just we have our um, for controlling this mesh thing for controlling this two three D effect. We just have simple scene. Also, we applied a lot of optimization here, so that's why maybe this code code is not as clear as it should. But but I didn't want to remove anything of this to not break it. <laughs> and here is uh, here is actually the rendering. So as you see, we are going through we are going through all these meshes we haven't seen. Do some transformations here, take, taking the UVs, and then we use Pixie Mesh to, to render everything on screen. Um, and this is how it works, how it looks. Sorry, this is the same cube you saw during, uh, yeah, you saw, saw in game. 
And uh, one more thing I would like to show is this UV mapping. Uh, so here, here are our correct calculations, correct to display to display the number on the surface, and taking consideration that that the UV coordinates are between zero and one. Yeah, it's showing that I can fit it. But what happens if we forget about this and just just map entire texture? As you can see, entire texture is displayed. It has some. Uh, it's like it's deformed a bit even, uh, and of course uh, this is pr this is project so. It has like alpha areas, and that's why the cube is is not filled. It looks a bit strange. And again, optimizations. So the first the first implementations worked for us, but it was a killer. It was a killer for CPU, so we need to we need to do something to fix it. And the first thing was just update only visible meshes. When you rotate the cube, you don't have you don't you don't see all surfaces at the same time. So the point is to update all of them. Next thing was to use to, was to use mesh pooling. I think that in game development the pooling uh, object pooling pattern could be your good friend, and you should use it when you need it. When you when you when you need it. Uh, and the last thing was to use um, transformation matrix, apply transformation with one matrix. So again, do not create uh, every matrix for every transformation. This is why we use matrices to use only one for all of this crazy stuff we want to do in our games. And the last, the last, um, the last topic I would like to cover is particle systems. Basically, particles uh, and particle system is just a set, is just a set collection of points in space in 3D or 2D space. But unlike like static geometry, those particles create system which is not static. So each particle goes through complete life cycle. Particle is born, changes over the time, and after that it dies off. And the cool part, cool part with this is that by changing, changing some parameters, we can, we can affect the particles, so we can create different types, really different types of effects, like fire or just some leaves. The good thing is that if we can create like full screen animations having only one or two images. So it's super powerful. And this is like list of some 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 factors, some parameters we can change, we can apply to our to one particle. Of course, as this is written, anything you want, so it's not only the only one. Uh, but I think this is the most popular one. So like life, like position, rotation, acceleration, etc., etc. Uh, but you can also change the way or affect the way how particles are emitted by changing the emitter emitter parameters. So emit emitter is like a count, and we can set the direction. We can set position. Uh, we can set some area like like rectangle, like cycle, circle, to and particles will be generated inside this area. 
lifetime, so should we stop emitting after the same time or maybe we should emit it forever? And the number of maximum particles in system and of course frequency. And code again. So first I will show you some effects and then well, I will show you the codes. Uh, yeah, we are, uh, in these examples I am going to use um, pixie particles, which is pretty simple but also pretty powerful. And the Halloween is coming so hopefully let's release some ravens. Yeah. <laughs> so as you see, we have like full screen animation. Uh, and I think they look nice. Maybe some movement could be tweaked. We can also really easily create some fireworks effect. And all, all, all particular effects was done by me, so maybe it could be done better. <laughs> but uh, you, got, you got the point and uh, I will show you the code. And also you can have some stars. Okay, so first let's see how we can really how we can implement this ravens. So yeah, we have we have sprite sheet for raven. It, look, it looks, looks like this. Uh, it's super tiny. Here we have JSON to be able to read it. And how looks the, the API? So we need to from the uh, we need to load of course our sprite sheet and create the animation. So this is done here. Also for for particle for pixie particles, uh, we can define the frame rate and the loop. And after that, we can create the instance of the emitter. Here is the layer we want, we want to display our ravens. Here is our configuration and here is our config. And I think I will show you this config because this is quite interesting. So yeah, it's like 46 lines of config and this is all we need to create these ravens. So, we could define the alpha at the start, like what is the value of the alpha at the start of, of the animation, of the, sorry, not animation, but of the start of the particle life cycle. cycle. And of course, mostly like the same rule apply, apply to, to each factor. Same for scale, for color, so we can define the initial and the final. Of course, speed rotation, lifetime, blend mode of, as well. And this is, uh, this, is, this is configuration of emitter. So how many particles, how many particles we have in our emitter and the position of the emitter. And here we want to display it inside, within the rectangle. The fireworks, config looks similar, so I don't want to go through it, but I think that the stars, the stars example could be really nice because in the, for the, ra in the Raven example, we, we define just, just the start and the end value. Here, as you see, we can also we can define the list. So we can, we can give, we can send to the emitter the config how how the value should be what what is the what is the value of the alpha or scale or, or any other parameter in given point in time very simple idea but once again very powerful and really like 
as you see, this config is also pretty short. So again, having like combining it with a bit of creativity and artistic soul, soul uh, you can boost your game, putting some nice, nice particle effects. And summary time, once again, and the last one. Benefits. Good way for modeling fuzzy objects such as fire, clouds, smoke, water, etc. Also like this full screen, full screen animation. Imagine how big would be the sprite sheet containing all this ravens. Uh, I think that it wouldn't make sense to put it in sprite sheet even. Uh, small size of texture, so once again, uh, one one sim one single image or like tiny frame by frame animation uh, combined together with combined together with particles that can create really cool effects. Mix mix content. So this is what we do in Exasio. That we very often uh, we apply animation for we combine the animations frame by frame animations with particles. We also modify some things in, in the runtime using twins and procedural animations. So this is like another another level and another thing which you can apply and create ni nice effects. Yeah, unique dynamic effects, it's kind of obvious and easy to extend and modify. Uh, we live in JavaScript world so we can apply any any parameter to particular we want and then any logic for it which can be useful in our, our game so that why why we should do this we should of course um, and I encourage you to do this as well but we need to be aware of couple downsides so it could be time consuming we are dealing here with a lot of small objects so uh, Having it too many on screen, too many in screen. Each object has to like we, we, we operate. We have calculations for each of these objects, so we need to be aware of it. Uh, also, once again, object pooling is your good friend for particles. Editor is required, so I w couldn't imagine how to create cool effect just changing some parameters in JSON file. Uh, luckily, Pixie, Pixie Particles uh, delivers editor as well. So you can like change the value and see the effect in the runtime. Yeah, and because of many, many objects, it could be a FPS killer. So I think that's all. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned something at least something. Yeah, thank you for your attention.